From the moment iron rails first carved their path across the earth, humankind dreamed of trains that could fly like the wind. When Stefton's rocket reached a whopping top speed of 30 miles an hour in 1829, we imagined a world where trains would get increasingly faster. The invention of improved engines and electric railways made trains faster and faster. There was always a limitation, however, the tracks themselves. You could have a train go as fast as it wants, but have bad tracks and, well, it limits the speed. So how do you get faster trains? Well, you build the track as straight as possible at zero obstructions. Thus, the idea of the airline was born. A track as straight as an arrow, zero grade crossings, and as fast as lightning. One of the first and arguably the most successful airline railroads christened itself as a seaboard airline, a name whispered with awe, promising a swift passage through the south. An arrow of steel and steam outpacing even its fiercest rival, the Atlantic coastline. Even though, if you look at the two systems, you can tell the airline part of their name was slightly exaggerated. Out of the almost 60 airline railroads created in the United States, most were short line railways that were quickly absorbed into a network of a much larger railroad. Other airline railroads were purely for marketing, neither being very straight, fast, or free of obstacles. There was one exception, however, a railroad that's so insane, so unhinged, that it might have just worked. A man by Dr. Wellington Adams proposed the unthinkable, a high-speed electric railway connecting Chicago to St. Louis. The 252-mile system would connect the cities through a straight line with trains running at 100 miles an hour. Dr. Adams is not the hero of our story, however, as his plans were quickly cast aside by naysayers. It did, however, set the precedent for what was possible at the time. Our true hero, Alexander Miller, was once a humble dispatcher for the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railway. But Destiny had other plans. He left his job behind and found a bank in Aurora, and soon after, he invented a groundbreaking signal blocking system and established a company to bring his invention to the world. While his success story was already impressive, Miller was far from finished. Amidst juggling the duties and obligations of his two businesses, a moment of divine inspiration, the great train gods themselves whispered a vision into his mind, a gleaming path of electric steel binding Chicago to New York in a line so straight it could have been drawn by the hand of a god. 750 miles of tracks, no crossings, and grades no larger than 0.5%. It would be 150 miles shorter than the New York Central or Pennsylvania Railroad's alternative routes, saving hours on the journey. It was beautiful, and it was the future. Until reality tugged us back down to Earth. Let us, for a moment, pause and ponder a few tiny little problems with this grand vision. First, let us remember this is 1906, an era where railways had only just begun to take their modern form. A project like this, a new railway of this scale, had never been attempted before, let alone by a railroad drawing power from a third rail, which was a concept growing in popularity at the time, but only on humble metro systems like the Chicago L or New York subway. And these, my friends, are the lesser challenges. Now let's talk about the truly impossible. The ancient spine of the Appalachians, immovable and daunting, stood in the airline's path. It would be a monumental challenge to carve through these mountains at all, let alone in a straight line. Worst of all, Miller envisioned this train running at a grade no higher than 0.5%, an engineering feat almost impossible today, let alone over a century ago. What started as a dream now loomed as one of the largest, most audacious engineering undertakings the world has ever seen. Our hero remained undeterred by this massive undertaking, however, and he set up a holding company to start funding the endeavor. To complete this monumental task, Alexander set up a construction of the routes to be completed by local firms, essentially contracting the work out to smaller engineering companies. The first of these companies was set up as the Goshen, South Bend, and Chicago Railroad. The construction of a feeder line from Laporte to the mainline site was commenced on September 1st, 1906 by the man himself. However, this was also the sign that this dream might have been too far-fetched as a three and a half mile track took almost a year to construct, signaling that construction would be much slower than initially expected. 
This did not deter the fabled construction, however. For each month, the pages of airline news fluttered into the hands of eager citizens, rejoicing with tales of the progress of the railroad. The newspaper's success was nothing short of a miracle, stirring the imaginations of thousands of people and raising over $2 million, which is more than $70 million today. The yearning for high-speed trains continued when the construction of the main line commenced westward. But this is where the real problems began. This section of the main line would craft across three different railroads, and the strict requirements of grade separation and slopes required the construction of three massive bridges. Investors were already becoming skeptical about the project's timeline, and the financial crash of 1907 forced many of the investors to slow funding, with some of them leaving the project entirely. Nevertheless, work continued with the main line reaching Route 421 in June of 1908. To make up for some of the investors leaving the project, an amusement park was constructed called Airline Park with trains from the port shuttling visitors to the park. This was both a financial and publicity triumph, with the park bringing in thousands of visitors a week and marketing the airline at the same time. While wildly successful, the amusement park could not keep up with the project's most daring challenge yet, Coffee Creek. A massive bridge for, let's be honest, a relatively small and very shallow creek. At the same time as the main line was under construction, the Valparaiso Northern Railways was created as a subsidiary railroad, constructing a feeder line from Valparaiso to Chesterton. This railroad would start passenger service in 1910, even before the main line was connected to it via the Goodman Junction, which wouldn't be completed until 1911. By now, the Chicago New York airline was in deep financial trouble. Investors' confidence was crumbling fast, and for pretty good reason. It had taken over four years and millions of dollars just to build a mere 22 mile stretch of track across a flat, forgiving terrain. Add in whispers of financial mismanagement and even outright fraud, and the writing was on the wall. The dream was dying, and the airline was running out of steam. The railway, struggling to make any sort of profit, took its last investments and built interurban railroads in nearby suburbs. This led to the construction of interurban lines in East Chicago, which failed to make any significant money for the railroad, making its already dire financial situation catastrophic. The final Hail Mary of the company was the establishment of the Gary Connecting Railways, acting as the connection from Goodman Junction to Gary, where the construction had halted on the main line. Miller and many of the company's shareholders saw this as the only hope of keeping the company alive as construction of the main line was now completely halted. Construction of the line was completed in 1912, and while the scheme saw modest success, it was far too little too late. Investors were angered by the lack of meaningful progress on the main line and lack of significant expansion of the company's inner urban routes. Seeing no tangible future for the electric airline, shareholders turned on Miller, staging a rebellion to seize control of the company's only profitable assets, its scattered inner urban routes. The evil and ruthless investors got their way and incorporated all the subsidiaries of the airline into a separate holding company named the Gary and Inner Urban Railroad, leaving the airline railroad with a now functionally useless mainline. And so, with a whimper and a sigh, Alexander's dream flickered out. The last whisper of its existence came from its local newspaper, which itself fell silent shortly after the consolidation of the Gary and Inner Urban Railroad. This was the official death of Alexander Miller's dream, a wonderful dream of a whimsical train flying across the country, spreading joy like a plague across the nation. The successor railway fared no better. Just five years after its founding, it too ceased all operations, leaving behind only a silent right away, the last remnant of Miller's grand dream, destined to never feel the rumble of a train again.